Tonight, episode two, written out of history with our great friend, Senator Mike Lee. This is where freedom rings. If you believe in America, if you believe in the Constitution, the Constitution empowers us. It's a new day. America's back. America's back and America's gonna get strong again. We're gonna defend America and we're gonna defend our interests. Liberty's Voice, Levin TV. We've heard this phrase recently from you. Yes. On the Senate floor and elsewhere, this writ of assistance. What is a writ of assistance? A writ of assistance basically is, um, imagine a warrant, a, a, a court order that just says, we hereby give uh, Officer X, Y, and Z the power to go and find evidence of unlawful activity. Make it so. That's fundamentally incompatible with what we now have as a protection in the form of the Fourth Amendment that requires particularity in a warrant and requires that any warrant be issued uh, by a judge uh, on the basis of probable cause of criminal activity. And without that combination of things, the, the evidence establishing probable cause and particularity, uh, a, a, a judicial order uh, uh, with a warrant, you shouldn't be able to go in and search someone's home. Well, back during the, the, the late revolutionary period, in, in other words, the, the period of time leading up to the American Revolution, mm -hmm. the British officers were doing this left and right with writs of assistance, even though it was prohibited uh, under English law, even though there, there were rights established that guaranteed Englishmen, including those residing in America, uh, uh, the, the, the degree of privacy necessary to protect against this. James Otis spoke out against this, and he litigated against it. And he was an early advocate for the principles that are now embodied in the Fourth Amendment. It's particularly relevant today as we see uh, the federal government, the NSA, acting through, among other things, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, purporting to have the authority to go out and collect uh, data, including the, the substance of conversations, as long as they involve a person who is deemed an agent of a foreign power, they can go in and record conversations and then go back through and search the database, including those recordings. Which is what we've been hearing about lately. Yes, even, even if they are U.S. citizens who have themselves done nothing to arouse suspicion. So that's why this is so, still relevant today. That's why the story that I tell of James Otis still matters today. Uh, later this year, we're going to be asked to uh, revise and reauthorize Section 702 of the FISA Act. It's one of the reasons why I've got grave concerns with it. When people read the story of James Otis, they'll see why. The story of James Otis. Also, the story of Susan Rice. And the story that we've been reading more and more and more of these so-called, and that's what you're talking about, incidental collection of information. The revelation or unmasking of American citizens who've done nothing because they haven't been charged with anything. Uh, putting their names in reports, having recorded them, transcribed them, unmasking them, putting the names of reports. And a recent Circa uh, analysis said that this past year, 2016, tripled the number of occasions in which that sort of thing happened from the prior year. And this is this Section 702. You've had some qualms about this in the past, haven't you? I have, and I voted against it last time it came up for reauthorization. I joined together with a number of liberal Democrats on the Judiciary Committee, with Dick Durbin and Pat Leahy, with whom I disagree on many other issues, but I have agreed from the outset of my service in the United States Senate that there are problems with Section 702 of uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, look, we, we don't ever want to get back into a situation where the government possesses something similar to a writ of assistance. And we know from the Church Commission reports uh, a few decades ago <clears throat> that in every presidential administration, from FDR all the way through Nixon, uh, the intelligence gathering agencies of the federal government were used for political espionage. Mm -hmm. Meaning if they didn't like you, if they didn't like me, if they didn't like uh, your neighbor or my neighbor or anyone else, they could go out and say, I want to take down that person. Mm -hmm. I want to get some information on that person. Even if you had done nothing wrong, they could go after you and collect information until they have what they need to embarrass you, humiliate you, or even worse, subject you to criminal prosecution. That's scary. And every American ought to be worried about that. It looks like the House is taking steps to look into that. Yes. Do you know if the Senate is? Yes. Lindsey Graham seems to be 
pressing this too. He, he is, and Lindsey Graham is someone with whom I've disagreed on this very issue at times in the past. But Lindsey Graham is seeing it. He, he's uh, got evidence apparently suggesting that of him. he himself uh, w was a victim of this. So he's, he's grasping this, and we've got more people uh, on both sides of the political aisle who are seeing this as a potential problem. Because look, when you've got a federal government that's now uh, spending around $4 trillion a year, that imposes $2 trillion in regulatory compliance costs, that has more criminal laws on the books than we can even count. I mean, no, no joke, we tried uh, to get an estimate a few years ago of how many federal criminal laws there are. We were told know. it's unknown and unknowable. Yeah. When you've got all of that uh, cu coupled with unfettered discretion to look into things that are private, you've got a recipe for disaster on your hands, a recipe that could destroy liberty. And yet, while liberal Democrats may join you in some of these things, they help build this Leviathan where it's inevitable. Isn't it odd? Yes, and that is what happens. I mean, look, this is what big governments do. It's one of the reasons why uh, Madison explained in the Federalist Papers that you know, wh wh what is government but the greatest... Uh, uh, window into human nature that exists. If, if men were angels, they'd have no need of government. If men could be governed by angels, they wouldn't need all these rules mm -hmm. surrounding government. But we're not angels, and we don't have angels available to govern over us. So we need rules to make clear that those who make and enforce and interpret the rules themselves uh, have to follow. If they do, the people benefit, and the government can continue to be something that serves the people. But to the extent we drift from that, and we have drifted significantly, the people can be made the servants of the government. We never want that to be the case. And to the extent that is now the case, we've got to reverse it. It's one of the reasons I wrote this book. When people read Written Out of History, they'll, they'll come to a greater understanding of how far we've drifted and what it is that we can do to change the political dialogue and bring people back to the message of liberty. Do you think people understand the message of liberty? It seems to me liberty means different things to different people. And again, Lincoln made that point. Talked about people claiming the liberty to own slaves. And people claiming, no, that's not liberty. That's quite the opposite of liberty. But even in modern times, it seems to me a lot of people seem to think liberty is the liberty to get free stuff so you're free to do what you want to do. And that's not liberty. And yet, I think, thanks to the left and thanks to certain politicians and so forth, People, people misconstrue, not, not most people, but enough people, a lot of people, misconstrue liberty for, for government benefits or government regulations or government equalizing this or government taking care of that. Am I wrong about that? Oh, you're, you're exactly right. And it's one of the reasons why some of the people discussed in this book have been written out of history, why they're forgotten today, is because their stories, their narratives are inconsistent with the modern progressive ideology, the narrative that people have been taught in public schools. It's one of the reasons why people should uh, look to this as a homeschool curriculum or a curriculum supplementing uh, students of every age, even people who are not formally in school. But here's, here's the way I look at it, Mark. Um, a right, rights involve the identification of something that the government can't do to you. A right is something the government cannot do to you, not something the government must provide for you. And when you flip that around and suggest that government can do anything to you it wants mm -hmm. and it must provide you with certain things, you, you, you flip the entire script to the point that the people really do become subservient to the government, dependent upon the government. No one wants to live in that world. Even the progressives who openly tout this stuff, if they really think about it and follow, the, follow it all the way through, don't or at least shouldn't want to live in that world. We've seen how that movie ends. It's not pleasant. We don't want to go there. And, and, and look, the, the message that I have here is that none of this has to be either particularly conservative or particularly liberal. This is, um, this is politically, ideologically agnostic. The point here is that the American people ought to identify limits on what the federal government can do to them. Once they identify those limits, then they can decide what kind of government they want, as long as they do it at the appropriate level and subject to the appropriate limitations. I think a lot of people do that, and a lot of people don't. In other words, but I think those of us who do it, we get frustrated. It's, okay, so how does this manifest itself? You vote, and 
you know, kind of stuck in the quicksand. You go to a judge, it's Obama appointee, well, there you go. So going to campaign comments, you know, stuff like that. So people get more and more frustrated. You understand that. Yes. And they don't know what to do. They and don't. you would tell them, be resolute, just keep pounding away, right? Pretty much. I mean, so beat the other side down rather than have them beat you down. Yes. And, but even more than beating the other side down, win the other side over with the right arguments. Win the other side over by... Let me ask you about that. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the thinking is that the Revolutionary War was fought by about a third of the populace, supported by about a third, opposed by about a third, and a third was somewhere in the middle. And that's about right from what I've read. I mean, we even had a militia in, um, in South Carolina and some parts of Alabama and some of the cotton-growing states who rose up against the colonists, the colonists fighting colonists, you know, because they said, well, we don't care what's going on in Boston. We're selling cotton to Britain, and we're perfectly fine with it. But anyway, um, do you buy that today? I, I mean, I have said that I think, and maybe I'm wrong, that about 30, 35, 40 percent of the American people really cherish liberty, and then so many others don't think about it or don't care about it and may not care about it till it's too late. Do you, do you think that's about right? Yeah, I do. And it's actually a message that I think is not only accurate, but it's something that should give us hope. Mm -hmm. We have to remind ourselves, if, if we're always comparing ourselves against an impossible standard, can, believing that everyone has to agree with us, then, then we will fail and we'll be miserable doing it. Um, if we believe that we necessarily even have to have uh, a significant supermajority or a, even a simple majority, we don't. We don't have to have everyone. We don't even necessarily always need a majority of all people. We just have to have enough. Now, that's what they did in Philadelphia in 1787 when the first few delegates arrived. They, they didn't have everyone. But they eventually had enough, enough to at least get started. Uh, they didn't have everyone on board at the time of the revolution. Uh, but they had enough, roughly a third. Today, it's never been more important than it is right now to have enough on the side of liberty. As long as we speak with a clear voice, with a consistent message, and a message that, that, that sings, that, that, that resonates to the, uh, the, the undeniable rights uh, the, that accompany the dignity of the individual human soul, we can win. We can win this. But we've got to be on the same page. And we've got to bring on a few converts along the way. We've got to bring on some people who don't even realize that they like liberty uh, as much as they ultimately will. And you know what? Something's interesting, Mark. Mm -hmm. I don't think there has ever been a time in my lifetime more ideal than right now for finding consensus on this. We got a, a couple of big groups of people in America. Well, one big group who helped elect Donald Trump to be president, and they did so because they wanted things to change in Washington. They wanted the swamp to be drained. For them, it's an easy sell to say we've got to shift power away from Washington back to the people. But then we've got another big group of people who supported Hillary Clinton. They didn't want to drain the swamp. They wanted Hillary Clinton as president. But now that President Trump's in power, they're suspicious of the federal government in ways that they never have been before. Those two people can provide us uh, with some overlap that really can bring us liberty, bring us to a point where we're ready to restore both federalism and separation of powers in ways that no one would have predicted even just a few years ago. These are unique times. We have a uniquely uh, a, a exquisite moment th that's upon us. All that we need is for more Americans to be singing the song of liberty. Do you think, to your point, that uh, when I look at sanctuary cities and this sort of thing, do you think it's more a convenience? Do you think it's more ends justify the means? In other words, sure, we'll support federalism if we can get our result. Now, you and I don't believe that, but as a rule, no, we're not going to support uh, state authority and so forth. I find the left bounces back and forth for, uh, for political convenience. Sure. So they support sanctuary cities today. I've said we ought to have sanctuary Second Amendment cities. Okay, fine. They have their sanctuary. Just tongue in cheek. And how would that go down? In other words, if states or cities said, you know what? We'll follow the Second Amendment. We'll embrace the Second Amendment. We don't care what you say in Washington, D.C. They wouldn't get away with that, would they? No. No. And yet sanctuary cities, effectively, they do get away with that. Right. Okay, so, which brings me to another point, and then I want to ask you about 
Luther, Luther uh, excuse me, uh, Mercy Otis Warren. Are we living in a period now that's a little scary with the kind of lawlessness that's going on, whether it's federal judges, that's not new, but what they did in the president's executive order is new. I'd not seen that before. Taking a campaign statement and then projecting it in, and we have almost 500 sanctuary cities and states that have basically thumbed their nose at the federal government. I call these neo-confederate states and cities. They would hate it, which is why I call them that. And then they're nullifiers. You know, the left used to oppose nullification, but they're the nullifiers. What do you make of all this? Uh, those are interesting times. And look, it's, it's not just faux federalism. It's almost the opposite of federalism. Part of what makes federalism work is that we agree through our Constitution that certain things are going to be decided federally and other things will not. Those that are not will be left to the states, respectively, or to the people. One of the things that is federal, unambiguously so under the Constitution, uh, involve things dealing uh, with immigration and naturalization. That is a federal thing. So you, they can't wave the flag of federalism and saying they want to be sanctuary cities to the extent that what they're trying to do is undermine a responsibility that is unequivocally uh, one that is assigned to the federal government. The other interesting thing here is that those efforts to crack down on sanctuary cities end up being tied to federal funding. In other words, if a police department that is receiving federal funding uh, under some of these proposals uh, decides to be a sanctuary city, they'll lose some of that. That could, quite oddly enough, end up bringing about more federalism. If we got more of the federal government out of what is supposed to be local, and if we allowed the federal government to focus on what is undeniably, unambiguously federal, we'd be in a much better place. The lawlessness you describe with these judges is a scary thing. You and I are both what I think I would describe as textualists, originalists. We believe that judges should look at the law based on what it says, rather than on the basis of what they wish it said. And when a judge looks at this and says, I, I, I know that the text of the executive order uh, appears to be consistent with the president's authority under section 212F of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And I know that on the face of it, it doesn't discriminate religiously but we're nonetheless going to re review this executive order in light of things that we think the president might have meant on the campaign trail a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. That's scary. That's overstepping the judicial bounds. And that's one of the reasons why I think these court orders are going to be overturned. And it is getting, it is at the court. And the court's moving at breakneck speed because it's time for vacation, among other things. Uh, could we potentially even get a unanimous court on this? I, I think it's possible, because I think if they look at the law based on what on their it own, says. On their own decisions. Uh, on their own decisions and on the basis of what the law actually says, I, I, I think that's exactly what will happen. It just amazes me that you have a Fourth Circuit. What was it, 11 to 3, something like that? Uh, you have the Ninth Circuit, the circuit. You know, Obama appointed 40% of the federal judges that are out there. It's, yes. it's incredible. It is. Now, the Fourth Circuit a few years ago was, was, solid. Was, was solid. It was a bastion of textualism. It was a court that prided itself on being uh, straight down the line. Uh, uh, we call it as we see it. The Ninth Circuit, as you're aware, oh, crazy. has long been a, a problem child within the federal judiciary. So that part's less The D.C. Circuit surprising. was too, and they added three seats or two seats. Yes. And just unbelievable what they, get, what they did and what they got away with. I mean... Uh, if that's not core packing, I don't know what is. Let's talk about Mercy Otis Warren. You said that she was the wife of James Otis? Yes. Tell us about her. Mercy Otis Warren was a close friend of John Adams and also something of a protege of his. She was a playwright, she was an author, a polemicist. She was someone who was well known in uh, revolution era America. She was extremely well-spoken, much more outspoken than most women of her era, and extremely well-educated. She was a patriot. She understood that there's this tenuous relationship between human liberty and government. On the one hand, we need government to protect us, to protect us from each other and from those on the outside who would do us harm. On the other hand, she understood that whenever government acts, it does so at the expense of our individual liberty. And so we should carefully cabin what we authorize government to do. It reminds me of this movie I saw when I was a kid where there's this tyrannical king who in a fit of rage one day said, that's it, 
I'm canceling Christmas. My immediate thought when I saw that as a kid was, well, why would they ever give the king the power to decide whether or not there's Christmas? That shouldn't be a king thing. Mercy Otis Warren probably could have written something like that had she foreseen our time. She did foresee our time in the sense that she wrote extensively in reaction to what was being proposed as the Constitution and, and said, hey, this might not be all fun and games. This could be dangerous. She predicted that we could end up with a sort of monarchy in miniature as we would have people elected from the various states to come to Congress and serve there, forgetting their home states and their home constituencies. She worried about the excessive blending of power between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and judicial branch, how that could be distorted. She worried that there were not sufficient protections in the Constitution uh, to protect the people against tyranny. And she worried about the absence of a Bill of Rights, worried perhaps as much as anything else about the inadequate protection for state sovereignty, state authority. She was an anti-federalist? Yes. And she and John Adams ended up having this extensive back and forth through uh, letters that got quite contentious, got quite heated, really tried their friendship to the point that they uh, were, were really in this very polite uh, uh, Yankee aristoc aristocratic fashion, uh, bluntly dissing each other, saying, uh, look, um, I, I'm, I'm going to pretend you didn't just say that and things like that. At the end of the day, they were able to restore their friendship, uh, as I explain in the book. But the warnings that she raised about what we might be doing in creating the federal government were prescient. They were uh, way ahead of their time. And uh, one of the reasons why I included the chapter about her is because if we had heeded the warnings of people like Mercy Otis Warren more fully, if we remembered her today, then I think we'd be a little bit more suspicious of federal power and the extent to which it's taken over everything else. I also wonder about whether we would know more about her had she not said these things. Had she, for instance, been a huge advocate saying it's not going to be a problem, uh, don't worry about it, you don't have a thing to worry about with the new federal government, perhaps her name would be more prominent mm. today than it is. It's one of the reasons why I included her in the book. If you had been living back then, would you have been a Federalist or an Anti-Federalist? I've always believed that I would be a Federalist. Uh, and, and, and I still believe that. And the reason is, I think the Constitution as written really did do the job. I wish there had been a couple of additional protections. I, I, I would have felt more comfortable had we used the elbridge gerry version of what became the Tenth Amendment, rather than the version uh, as stripped down by James Madison, uh, so that it said all power is not expressly granted to Congress, uh, nor prohibited by the Constitution to the states, should be reserved to the states respectively or to the people. If we had gone with it that way, I would have been more comfortable with it, because it would have been uh, more clear uh, what was already the case, that the powers of the federal government are few and defined, and those reserved to the states are numerous and indefinite. Nonetheless, I think I would have been persuaded by those who said the protections are sufficient. And for 150 years, Mark, they were right. For 150 years. Uh, I don't mean to suggest there was a utopian civilization in America, but there was something pretty close to constitutional government mm -hmm. that lasted basically into the New Deal era when we started drifting away from federalism and separation of powers. Now, Madison's defense, there'd be no, right, no amendments but for him going to the floor of the House and pestering them in the first Congress. That's right. Because they pretty much blew it off, and he wouldn't let them. He wouldn't let them. And one of the reasons why he wouldn't let them is that he made promises to those who were insisting on a Bill of Rights, uh, promises uh, to, uh, to people like Luther Martin, like Mercy Otis Warren, uh, and like George Mason, promises to help persuade those people and those who were sympathetic to their arguments that it was okay to ratify. And, uh, because they were losing Massachusetts, they were losing Virginia, and they were losing New York. That's right. And they had to make this promise because these amendments really came out of the states. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, you know, to his credit, Madison followed through on that promise. He, he made this promise, uh, and the promise was kept. Madison kept at it even in the face of great difficulty. It's one of the reasons why I have such reverence for James Madison. Uh, e even though I, I, I don't agree with everything he said during the Constitutional Convention, he got it to a good place, and he made it 
an even better place with the Bill of Rights, which he fought so aggressively to have. In the Federalist Papers, there's never been anything like the Federalist Papers, an exposition of what they were doing and why they did it and what they believed in. And, and I mean, if people just read the Federalist Papers, and they're really not taught. I was never taught the Federalist Papers. I'm almost 60 years old. The extent I know the Federalist Papers, I read them myself. I don't remember. Were you guys, were you, any of you taught about the Federalist Papers? No. Were you taught about the Federalist yes. Papers? Yes. That's Utah. That's I, I was taught about them in my home, but we yeah. also discussed them in high school. I went to Timfew really? High School in Provo, Utah. We talked about them extensively there and also at BYU. Well, I should have gone there. But uh, they weren't taught at Temple University, I can tell you that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, on the Constitution side, um, do you think in many respects we live in a post-constitutional period? I don't think I would describe it as a post-constitutional period. an extra-constitutional yes, period? Yes, definitely in an extra-constitutional period where a lot of government occurs outside of the Constitution. Uh, uh, in particular, a lot of the federal government occurs outside of the Constitution. I mean, look, I, I've got these um, visual aids I keep in my office. Um, two stacks of documents. One is a few inches tall, a few hundred pages long, consists of the laws passed by Congress last year. The other stack is 97,000 pages long, it's 13 feet tall, and it consists of last year's federal register. That's the cumulative annual index of federal regulations as they're announced for notice and comment and later finalized. So most of our laws measured by weight, volume, word count, economic impact, uh, you name it, is now uh, coming through the executive branch bureaucracies outside of the constitutional framework. Setting aside the fact that a lot of this stuff occurs outside the realm of what we could properly consider a federal responsibility. It's also de facto legislation that occurs outside the framework of Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1, the Legislative Powers Clause, and Article 1, Section 7, the Presentment Clause. It says in order to pass a federal law, you've got to have concurrent passage. You've got to have a passage within the same Congress by the House, by the Senate, and signature by the President or acquiescence. And all this bypasses that. All this bypasses that. So, yes. We are absolutely living in a time when a whole lot of government activity, especially federal government activity, occurs extra-constitutionally. That is a problem. We can what, reclaim what it. What do you think these people would think about that? Oh, they, they would be appalled by that. First of all, I want to be clear. These people, the, the eight uh, forgotten founders who I cover in Written Out of History, I think every one of them, to a person, would be thrilled in many respects with what they see today. They'd be thrilled with the fact that we're still alive, the fact that we're still intact, the fact that we're not flying the Union Jack, we're not subject to, to a monarch in London, the fact that we have our own government. They would be appalled, I believe, at the amount of governing that has now been taken away from the American people and moved to Washington, D.C. Then within Washington, D.C., that's been outsourced by the people's elected lawmakers and given to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. Look, these are smart people. These are wise people, hardworking people, the, the, the federal bureaucrats who make these regulations. But there's one problem. They're not constitutionally empowered, and they're therefore not accountable to the people at regular intervals. You don't vote for them. You can't. I can't. Nobody can. They're uh, uh, about as removed from the will of the people as anything you can find. I can't find a single, when I was doing my research on Men in Black, I can't find a single, even quasi-prominent participant in the governing, developing our governing system who would have supported what the courts have become. Certainly not. In fact, uh, at the time the Constitution was written and undergoing the ratification process, it was referred to accurately, I think, as the least dangerous branch. In many respects, that's still true. But the fact that they're less dangerous than the other two doesn't mean they're not dangerous and at all. Rudis specifically focused in on that. Yes. And was very concerned about the courts. He said, I see no limitations. Now, as you know, they don't say a lot about the court what the court is and so forth, and that's what concerned him. Well, they had a lot of concerns, a lot, a, lot, a lot of the, but they had to come up with their document. And so, um, where do you think we've gone wrong? I don't mean whether it's separation of powers or that. Do you think the mentality of the nation has changed? Do you think that Wilson and the progressives have won, that basically, at least for now, um, the government much more reflects 
their edit, you know, their view, their Hegelian view, their, I won't put this word in your mouth, their more Marxist view when it comes to materialism and historicism. Do you think they have won out right now? We're on defense. The progressives certainly have gained some very material ground. Uh, Woodrow Wilson moved it along. He got some pushback from the courts and to a degree from Congress. FDR, uh, a couple of decades later, roof. shot it through the roof. And what they both fell victim to was the tyranny of the expert. The, the amount of faith that we're asked in our country today in our republic to place in government experts, experts is appalling. We're asked in many instances to say, look, these are the jurors. These, these men and women in black robes, mm -hmm. uh, they are the all wise sages, uh, like living oracles who can tell us what our law says. And if that means they're taking debatable matters, not even mentioned in the Constitution beyond debate, so be it, because they are the experts. That is the progressive vision. That is the progressive dream, but it's our nightmare as lovers of liberty. Uh, that's one of the many reasons why we have to refocus on what government is in general, what the federal government is in particular, and within that federal government, who does what within the federal structure. What we know is that they're not supposed to be making law, laws if they're wearing black robes. Got one last question for you. And by the way, this is an unbelievable book written out of history by the uh, conscience of the Senate. That's what you are, as far as I'm concerned. The forgotten founders who fought big government. You can get it anywhere right now. It is doing superbly well because it's a great book. You're a great senator. Here's my question to you. My final question. How's President Trump doing overall? Look, I think he's doing well. I think he has a strong desire to drain the swamp. And I think he's doing what he can so far to get us there. I think he's given us Judge Neil Gorsuch, now Justice Neil Gorsuch, who is going to fulfill, I think, uh, the, the legacy and the promise of the Nino Scalia uh, mission on the court, which is to make the court more about interpreting laws than making them. Um, I think President Trump has signed into law now 13 resolutions of disapproval passed by Congress that undo late-breaking Obama-era regulations. That's 13 times the number of regulations that had been invalidated that way by a combination of congressional and presidential action. I applaud him for that. I, I applaud him for getting us out of the Paris Accord. Mm -hmm. This was a bad deal for the American people where they were asked to put tens of billions of dollars into an international fund to be managed by sort of uh, I I international bureaucrats who have no accountability to the American people. Uh, I applaud him for wanting and promising from day one, the moment he was sworn into office, I remember there was a, a line in his speech that gave me great comfort. He said, today the shift of power is about much more than the transfer from one presidential administration to another, the transfer of power from one party to another. This is about a shift in power from Washington, D.C., back to the American people. The fact that he's got that vision, the fact that he's been fighting for that vision, the fact that he's sticking to that vision so far from what I can tell is to be applauded. And I, I, I'm very grateful that he's willing to do that, and I'm going to do everything I can to help him. In I agree regard. with you. And we both supported Ted Cruz in the Republican primary process. Um, but, you know, as I supported him in the general election, I'm, he's doing exactly what he said he would try and do. You know, 80% of it is solid conservative, 20% of it is, is not. And he's fighting on all fronts. But what's troubling me right now, uh, to the extent you can comment on this, is, is the effort to destroy his presidency. I mean, we have a special counsel who's already expanding his power. Uh, we have these constant attacks, demand, you know, about impeachment and so forth. Uh, uh, people accusing him of obstruction of justice who don't even understand what obstruction of justice is. It's just me speaking. And I'm looking, I said, you know, I worked for Reagan for eight years. I lived through the Nixon years. I was a young man. There were some very, very bad times. I don't remember anything like this. And I certainly don't remember it in the first four months of a presidency. What is your thoughts on that? The fact that there is this much of an effort this early in an administration, before many things have even transpired, should itself be alarming to us. It should be a wake-up call for us to realize we've got too many eggs in the basket that is the federal government. 
when there's that much at stake that the Democratic Party and the progressive movement will materialize in the way they have. Uh, uh, coming, uh, building off of the thinnest evidentiary foundation to try to build a case against him, we should all be concerned. It's one of the many reasons why we should follow President Trump in draining the swamp, follow President Trump's admonition that we transfer power from Washington, D.C. back to the American people. The attacks against him are Exhibit A for why we need to do that. Exhibit A for why we need to drain the swamp and push the power back where it belongs, which is back to the people. So in other words, what you're saying, any challenge to this power, to this Leviathan that they've created, they react with such ferocity. That, is, is that, isn't that what's going on? Yes, yes, That's exactly. Your point? They react with such ferocity. These are the same people or it's the same kind of thinking that has written these people out of history, the people in, in my book, uh, were written out because they warned against big government. Donald Trump has been warning against big government and talking about shifting the power back. This thing is, is almost an, an organic entity. It's, it's almost an entity in and of itself. It wants to preserve itself. And so that's what it looks like when you try to drain the swamp. People push back. We've got to push back harder. Written out of history, the forgotten founders who fought big government Senator Mike Lee, it is a great honor. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. Appreciate it.